Welcome, Robert, for this session of the uh, art demo series by Fairfax Art League. We are very generously sponsored by the City of Fairfax Commission on the Arts, and uh, we are very, very happy to have you. So please go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Bobby. I'm Robert Yee is, Robert is my name, but I, I, I prefer to be called Bobby. Um, uh, I can tell you that I, I, I am, um, although I teach at Mason and speak with hundreds of people, I am very nervous now. I don't know why <laughs> it was fine with three people, uh, you know, in the in the room, but it seems like now it's just gotten um, a little bit more um, pressures on. But let me introduce who I am. Um, so like I said, my name is Robert Yi. I am a uh, I am the currently the assistant director at the School of Art at George Mason University and also the interim director of painting and drawing. I'm an assistant professor that teaches painting. Um, and I've been, I'm, I would say that I'm a local here, not in the city of Fairfax, but I've grown up in Northern Virginia all of my life. Actually, I was born in Seoul, Korea, came when I was four years old in the 70s. So that kind of gives you how, an idea of how old I am. Um, and uh, I, I like to think of myself as an educator, as an artist, as an administrator, and somebody that's deeply interested in DEI initiatives, which are um, diversity, equity, and, uh, uh, and inclusion initiatives, especially in art and in the, uh, and, um, you know, and, 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 and in the workplace. Uh, Another thing I like to, uh, another thing I do a lot is portfolio reviews. So um, a large part of my job well, in the past has been, um, and what I do here is I review portfolios, um, art portfolios for students when they enter into college. Um, before I was at George Mason, I've been at George Mason for about um, four years now, but before George Mason, I was at uh, Cor the Corcoran College of Art and Design. Um, before before George Washington University had taken that over. So I'd been there for a long time. There I was the uh, director of continuing education and um, a pre-college uh, program. So um, what we did was set students up so that um, give them training on how to present, uh, to create a portfolio in preparation for submission going to art school. And here at Mason, I continue doing that by reviewing um, studio portfolios. So anything that having to do with the, um, the visual arts, uh, I review portfolios for admission to the school. So I look at, I look a lot at, I look at a lot of art and, um, and I review a lot of art. I've done a lot of jury, um, a lot of a lot of jurying in this area for the Torpedo Factory in Bethesda in Fairfax, um, uh, and in Maryland as well. Um, I've had solo shows in Fairfax, uh, in um, in Manassas, in Italy, and um, in Berlin. Um, the other thing that you might know me for, like I believe it was nineteen, I think twenty. Maybe, maybe it was 2015 or 13, I think it was 2015. Um, we cre I, uh, I um, created the Metropolitan Project for the Arts, which was a pop-up gallery that was in the city of Fairfax, right on Main Street, um, that was uh, right now is Penny Pinchers. So at one time that place was, I think, I think it was called um, uh, the T-shirt, t-shirt dying place but it had a wonderful one uh, front glass uh, street view and I took that over for a summer and uh, created a gallery space um, that uh, that was there for a short period of time but in that short period of time I've managed to have I believe about five different shows including visual artists performance artists and um, it was my way of um, bringing uh, contemporary art and young artists and old artists together uh, and um, making, trying to bring, you know, reviving art in the city of Fairfax. As a result of that, you, you may, or I think you might know of Ollie Ollie, which is upstairs now on, on the same building where Potty, Pot, what is it? Um, Pottery Bar. Pottery, not that pottery part, pottery pinchers or something like that. Pot, uh, they're no longer there. So right now, I think Mode on Main is the store that's occupying occupying that space. But above it is Ollie Ollie, which is a uh, gallery slash uh, slash artist maker space. Um, uh, the the gallerist or, or the owner of that. Uh, 
person that's um, using that space is Jessica Kalista. She, I believe, was part of the Art League at one time. Um, and um, um, I mean, uh, part of the Fairfax art community. And she uh, she was actually was, uh, came to one of our shows, was inspired to create her own gallery space. And she kind of took over that, um, that um, upstairs and created a new, brought Fairfax into center stage in the, uh, in the art world. So that's a little bit about me. And I guess what I want to do to talk to you about today is one is how I came to be an artist, um, the progression of, of, how, of my work and to what it is today um, and what's happening at Mason. So, uh, um, you know, some idea, some information that's going on and um, programs are there that you may be interested in. And then, um, and then I think we, from there we can ask, um, you know, go over some questions. So um, I feel like that's enough. I hope I have enough information to cover this time and I hope I can keep you awake. Feel free, please, to, um, you know, raise your hand or turn on your mic if you have any questions as I go along. I like to think of this more as a conversation uh, rather than like a lecture, a boring lecture. So I'm you know, very familiar with, uh, uh, with uh, young people who, um, you know, get really bored <laughs> with long lectures. So I will try not to be that. And I think maybe if it, it helps uh, if we all participate, if you, like I said, if you see something that you want to say or you have a comment, please feel free to ask. So um, let's see, let me start off with um, a picture of what I'm going to start off with showing you a picture of, of what my art used to be, where I started, right? So let me share my screen. I have a whole bunch of things up there. Make sure let me, let me close down anything that's inappropriate. So that you, uh, here we go, uh, here and Let's hope everything is gonna look good over here. Sharing screen, there you go. All right, so I have a whole bunch of stuff up. I'm gonna show you one thing at a time. Hopefully it's a work. Um, okay, this, this here. Uh, all right. So I'm gonna study, I'm gonna show you work that I started off. Um, just some images of work that, you know, who I was an artist before, you know, I guess when I started painting, just show, show you a series of them. So you can kind of see the progression of how, I'm gonna just put, put, up, put up a whole bunch, just give you a sample of what it was that I, what, what kind of work I did. And then talk to you about what it is. So as you can see, I started off, um, you know, I started painting when I was very young. I mean, I think like my first first time I had a brush was six years old. But I grew up in I grew up in a first gen uh, Korean family that just came to America. You know, the thing about that is that when we come to the United States back in 1972. Families, you know, the goal was for us to have, you know, success and live the American dream and um, be successful and be, you know, prosper in America. And the idea of my parents of me wanting to be an artist did not fall into that plan. So, and, um, you know, I've always had an inkling to, to draw, to paint, to be creative, uh, but that was discouraged. Right. The idea of that was that, you know, you became here to America so that you can become a lawyer or a doctor or a, a successful person in America. Being an artist is not going to be uh, take you there. Uh, being an if you want to do that, you might as well. And back in the 70s, I guess, uh, what have what uh, the people who created movie posters? were actually painters. They made, they, they painted large posters of like what's happening in, like in the theaters. And they would say, well, you know, if you want to do that, you might as well be a, a movie poster painter. So um, this is not what you want to do. So I went, I continued. So I listened to my parents and said, you know, and also say that, you know, art can be a hobby, you know, do that for fun, but you need to be serious. You need as you, as a, you know, as the first son, the only son in America, 
your job is to make it here and be successful. Um, and I went through that. I, and, I, I, and I admit that I um, did pretty well in school. I went to UVA and I majored in foreign affairs and graduated with a BA with internet uh, doing um, studying international politics and went on to getting a consulting job in international business. Well, that lasted a short time, right? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, if I was doing it, but I was not happy. It was something that it's felt like, um, I think the thing that um, made me realize that this is not what I wanna do was, um, was coming out of the Metro. So like, you know, we, we get onto the Metro station at Falls Church, and then you go out into Washington, DC, you come home. And then I saw the, like, it looked like a scene from a zombie movie. Everybody was in their suits. Back then I remember when people wore suit and ties to work, would come in the briefcases, they'd be walking out of the Metro, drained of energy, going home and repeating it over and over again. Uh, and it felt like a, like a machine, doing something in the machine and not really doing something that was, um, that fulfilled my soul and made me happy. So I decided to go back to school. You know, I went, to, I completed a BA in foreign affairs and international politics. And I did what they, I mean, I tried out what they wanted me to do. In fact, I even tried going, um, you know, doing the medical school, um, medical school stuff, because I guess I found out that was not going to work because once I did biology and chemistry, I didn't do too well. And that just, that just kind of explained that, that, uh, that, that world is not for me. But I went back and applied to get my Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, and uh, at the Corcoran. Um, and then there I progressed and decided, and then everything worked out for, uh, I think one of the thing, the difference was, is that I was doing something that I was passionate about, something that I, I really loved doing, something that was um, something that like uh, it had, I had full interest in. The classes that I were taking were like I was engulfed in, like art history, art theory. I, I wanted to know, I wanted to soak up everything that has to do with art and why it came from, where it came from, who did it, why did they do it? Um, and, um, you know, I continued on and to uh, uh, get my master's in fine arts. And for me, and I think a lot of it is because that I really wanted to do, I was really passionate about what I was doing and I want to be engulfed in what I was doing. So I was fully immersed in everything that was art um, and doors opened up for me. I mean, I, I, got, I uh, got shows, I um, you know, got jobs that were related to art. Um, you know, I was got to be an administrative, an administration, an art administration in higher education. And, um, and that really worked out for me. But when I started painting, I actually learned painting in a different way from most people. I think um, people go to, um, and I think the, so when, when, the first, when I first went to art school, which was at the Corcoran, you know, undergraduate, the way that they taught art and painting, it wasn't like, okay, this is what you do first. You know, you create a circle, giving you like the traditional academic methodology of how to paint a painting. Rather that, that what, what they rather did was, you know, do what you do and let us see what we can do. Let, let's see what we can, um, let's see what, how we can make what you do better. And there's a point to why they do that. But, you know, be, when, before going to school, you know, before going to art school, my idea, we all had an idea of what art is, what painting is, what's supposed to look beautiful, right? And my way of learning how to paint was copying. So I copied art, right? And this is the way that I learned to duplicate, you know, by duplicating work, doing studies, I was able to see how to mix colors by trial and error. Uh, I was studied, I, I understood how brush strokes, how people, how different artists use different brush strokes.
Rob, are you still there? Hi, Bobby. What happened? We can't hear you. Bobby? We lost him. Yeah. He have his phone number, send him a text. Oh, dang it. But this is a crazy session today. <laughs> Hello? Well, I, I guess, I guess I um, cut off for a second. I don't know yeah, what happened. Yeah, you did. You did. Yes. I think my, I think my Wi-Fi might have gone out. I'm using my phone Wi-Fi, so I think I think that's a good thing that I have this emergency. Um, okay. Where did you all hear me laugh off? <laughs> what was the last thing you hear me say? <laughs> uh, Cortez. <laughs> Can you all see me? Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Just want to get just so that I know where I left off. Where was the last? What was the last thing that you heard me say? <laughs> you were saying that um, you learn how to do different styles and learn different brush strokes and um, be, by copying art. You were right, at okay. the at the red vase picture. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, so I learned. So I learned basically. I learned how to paint by duplicating things, and at the same time, I had in mind what. I, it was embedded in me um, what art is supposed to look like, you know. So we all have a conception of like what is what what is what is art? What is I mean? What is painting supposed to be? You know, how is it supposed to be done? There are some, some you know traditional Western European. Basically, I was learning those things and also um, believing, kind of like you know, thinking that this is what art looks like. So my work that I did going forward started to look very similar to something that would, had been done before. So the originality, you know, wasn't there, you know? Even a painting like this, a figure, a figure painting, which was done from life, it's very traditional academic painting. It's a pretty painting. I mean, I, I think it, it has all, um, you know, all the elements of um, you know, having a good composition, showing the lighting, brush strokes and all that, but um, does it do more than that, you know? So in art school, you know, I think that, and I think it all depends on which art school that you go to. Uh, there are schools in New York that, that emphasize traditional, um, traditional, traditional academic painting. There are other schools that encourage, you know, conceptual, contemporary, um, you know, more of uh, more of uh, you know work that has coming from 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 individual expression. Well, after doing years and years of years of duplicating work, I might have mastered the technique of painting, but what was lacking for me was individuality, right? So the question of like, you know, if we saw these paintings, well, here's the thing. So this is an original painting from life. This portrait is actually a, an original painting from life. It's not a duplicate of anything. But the question is, if this painting was shown, is there any distinction that would say, oh, that's a Robert E. painting, right? What makes this painting any different from another person's painting, you, another artist, besides the fact that you know uh, that I'm I, that may be original in the fact that it's from a you know painting that hasn't been done before? You know, it is a good example of academic painting and shows lighting and color, but what does it add to the language of contemporary art? You know, and you know it made me question what is an artist. Who is an artist, right? And and what is our job? And 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 you know, what role do I want to play? And I think, I think that I mean, for me, the explanation of who an artist is, or what an artist is, I think there's a difference between a hobbyist, right, and an artist. So what I mean by that is. 
and this is, I mean, I, again, this is like what, how I feel. And this is what I tell my students who are in, um, you know, in the School of Art, who are learning, you know, to become artists in the real world is, um, are you a hobbyist? Or are you an artist? Meaning, when you paint, are you painting for yourself? Or are you painting to share something? Right? So, when you paint, and I'm not saying that this is, uh, uh, you know, I think this is absolutely, I mean, people do this, this is a good thing. I'm not saying that if you want to do this as to, you know, to pass the time, to, you know, to, you know, en you enjoy the art of, you know, the, 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 the work, you enjoy painting, it, it is something that you love to do, but you don't share it with the world. I think that's a difference. If you're doing something just for yourself, you don't care what people think, how it's reviewed, how it's, um, you know, uh, how it's viewed. But just because just you have it and you keep it for yourself, then I don't know if you're an artist or not. I think the artist is somebody that does work that has the intention that it will be viewed by others. Now, the idea that, hey, is that person gonna accept, you know, um, you know, like, maybe you can't please everyone, but the fact that you may be able to touch someone or communicate with someone else besides yourself, you know, that's outside to share the same feeling that you have with another, I think that's what makes you an artist, right? To being somebody that's able to take work and then um, whatever emotion that you have, Right, whatever things that you have in mind, whatever whatever you want to talk about, that you're able to communicate with. Maybe not, you know, it doesn't have to be a bunch of people. It may be just one person, right? And if you're doing that, you're an artist. And I think we have another. I think there's another type of, um, uh, you know, uh, problem that we have here in society now, is that people are afraid to say that they are they are an artist. You know, I mean, you all of you are in um, this in the Fairfax uh, Art League, and I'm, I'm assuming. But I'm gonna I want to ask you how many of you ask, how many of you say when somebody asks you, hey, what do you do? You know, what what do you what are you what do you do for for, for a living? Or um, you know, what do you, um, who are you? Do you say, hey, I'm an accountant, I'm a teacher, or do you say, I'm a teacher and I'm an artist? Often people say, you know, I do art, but you know, it's just on the side. It's something that I like to do personally. But I want people to have more confidence in saying that, yeah, I'm an artist. You can say, you know, I'm a dentist and an artist, right? So when when people have confidence saying that, and I have the confidence to share, it makes a big difference, right? So you know, that's I think going off on a tangent, but. Um, that's what I started thinking about. Like, hey, if I am going to be somebody that's going to make art and make art to share with others, maybe I should have, maybe it's kind of my responsibility and, and this power that, you know, that I have now that I can share things with others. For me, I felt like it's better, I better have some messages that, um, that resonates with people, that's gonna change some ideas. And I just don't want people just to appreciate it and love it. I, for me, I want my artwork to be, have a little bit more meaning behind, but then just uh, make people feel, make it look good, right? For whatever, maybe, maybe sometimes make, make, makes people laugh, talk about some, some issues that are going on in the world, problems that I see, right? And that's how I started thinking about work. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here at this point is, Go to my website and kind of show you the work that I've done in progression, and you will see that um, that I don't really have, you know, I think my, if you say style work, I think it's been pretty, um, I would say, uh, random, right? Um, so I'm going to go from back, uh, from back uh, old to new, and uh, and this is not all my paintings, but the works that I have in my gallery. And I'll start by, I'll start off with this, these paintings. Um, I did a, a start 
doing a series of portraits. Oh, that's odd. Um, so in portraiture, you know, you saw how I did the picture of the black man. And I wanted to think about when I do portraits, I thought about more about, you know, how be a bit about being more stylized and also, you know, capturing the way, capturing images the way I see them. And kind of like doing it a caricature way, but also being able to communicate or to be able to, um, you know, relate to, to have somebody be able to relate to the other person. Sometimes I do this by softening the images. I also look for faces that were kind of that are kind of distinct. You know, um, one of the things I did here. So let me. I'll just go back to this. So here. I did a series of portraits of, of Korean people. So when I did these paintings, and I call these my mask series, um, one of the things that Korea, Korea is known for <laughs> is plastic surgery. So uh, I, think we, I think Korea has like the highest percentage of people that, that people do plastic surgery. So the, what a Korean face looks like, you know, Korean features, they're, you know, the, I think that what, the original Korean feature has no longer is is, is 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 not there anymore. The idea of the eyes have become bigger. The nose have become uh, the become, nose have become, become a pointier. Uh, they've uh, they've altered the face to make it look like kind of like a, a almost like a, a a doll. But I wanted to find um, you know I seeked out look, faces that had a distinctive Asian look that's kind of unadulterated by. Um, by plastic surgery or anything like that. Um, and the one place that I kind of looked toward was North Korea, because obviously there they don't have, they may, they may now, we just don't know, uh, have the, um, you know, the resource for them or, or have that as a, a, an important thing for them. But the faces there seem so, so natural. But the thing that I've noticed there is that when I was looking at faces, meeting people uh, from North Korea, there was kind of a shield that was going on in front of them. It almost like looked like that they all had a face, or the people that I'd met had a face that they were hiding. They were sternly, you know, expressing their face, but not telling, not not trying to tell people what's going on in the inside. You know, the so I thought that you know the concept was that um, you know these people in North Korea are there uh, and. Um, you know, showing in government and in, in videos and in in, in in propaganda that they're like, you know, they're happy and they're, they're enjoying their life, but inside they're not happy at all. So I thought them I thought of them as having wearing a mask. You know, the idea that they are, you know, basically putting on a face that's not a face that's not um, you know, that's you know, honest with them. Um, but then I heard about an interview with a with a with a, a North Korean, and we kind of put this idea that you know these people must not be happy, but you know ignorance is bliss. Maybe their world and their idea of what you know their idea of what is good and what is happy and what is successful, what is joy in life, is there, and then the mask that they're showing is just for us. You know, saying you don't know what's going on in my mind. I mean, I'm happy. You know, it's your it's your projection of what's going on. But or on the other hand, it's the opposite. You know, they are they are imprisoned in the in forever putting on a face, or putting on a mask, and not expressing who they are. But thinking about that, I mean, is it really just related to North Korea? Don't we all do this every day? You know. All of us, you know, continue, you know, all of us put on a front, put us, put on um, an image that we want the public to see. Women, men, I mean, they put on every day, they put on makeup, they do their hair, they put on suit, they put on a costume, right? So, you know, people put on masks to hide their natural self. 
for whatever reasons. In some, in, it may be in a small manner or in a, bit, in a larger manner, but the idea of being their true self, you know, society doesn't really allow that to happen. So I started painting, so the series of paintings were people who put on, um, or they look like to me that they're putting on an expression, kind of like a guard, you know? Um, is, it a, is it a guard to protect themselves? A guard to, um, you know, to hide what's precious to them, to keep something special to them? And I started, I started um, you know, altering the faces, finding the details, the highlights. You might consider it a, a, a caricature. You know, I think one of my um, professors back then, they say complicated, not complicated, but complicated. So simplifying the, sim simplifying the face features, you know, and then um, in, enlarging things, but doing it in a way, painting it in a way that's more, um, you know, having a painting in a way that's more complicated. This is Jenny Wu. She's actually uh, right now uh, uh, like being represented by Morton Fine Arts. She is, uh, she graduated American University. Uh, she, um, uh, her work has now does, she does a lot of like um, work that's cut, made out of layers of paint and cut into pieces and made, makes mosaic. Another face, another Asian face. And, I, and again, if you notice, I try to find people that have, well, Ollie doesn't, that have unique features that kind of stand out, right? It's not the typical norm. You know, um, what other people may consider grotesque, you know, I kind of see it as beautiful. Some, some, people, some people consider it like, you know, not, you know, the idea of beauty. I, 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 don't, I, see, I see kind of beauty in it. It almost it looks, she almost, this person whose face, Miki, she's actually uh, a Japanese student. Um, she had such a simple face. It almost, her face almost looked like a cartoon in a way. Then I did a series of what I called, uh, you know, Korean Gothic. You know, so I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, uh, there's a painting called American Gothic. It shows uh, an old man and his in the painting, it's a wife, but it's actually his sister uh, in there. But in the same way, kind of like showing the idea of mask again. And Koreans, for some reasons, I mean, I think it's changed now, but when I grew up, uh, when portrait, when people took portraits or had pictures, um, they didn't smile. It almost looked like they were angry. <laughs> This is Joan. Joan just recently passed away from cancer, so young. But again, she was, she was somebody, again, with features that were very unique, you know, not the typical. So I had to paint her. And this was, uh, this is a painting that's like inspired by, like I said, um, uh, passport photos. So this is my sister at a very young age, um, you know, scared <laughs> and trying to be, a, and you know, the, I think the photographer said, you know, trying to make a smile and at the same time, she is kind of terrified at the same time. The another, another form of a mask. So this is Lil' Kim. Actually, the reason why I want to show you that is I was going to do a series. This is when I was starting to do some, uh, and I was working on the North Korean paintings uh, of Kim Il-sung. I thought it was funny. His face was so fun looking. Um, but uh, I did, I, you saw Dolly before. One of the things I was planning to do is a series of paintings, of Dolly, Dolly, and Dolly. So so uh, Dolly Parton, Dolly Lama, and Do uh, Salvador Dolly. It's, it's just a project that I was thinking of. But I think I'm gonna. That's something that's gonna. I'm gonna do later. Okay. Again, with the stern faces. Uh, uh, Bobby, could you just also 
tell us a little bit about how you go on the canvas? What is your process on the canvas? Sure. So, you know, the traditional, so, I mean, although it may not look like a traditional academic painting, and I think I stylize this in a way, uh, the way I approach painting is very much old school, traditional um, way that was done by doing a Giselle. I do an undercoat of painting. Uh, I do, uh, uh, and I start off with a yellow ochre. I pr prime the canvas. I do a monotone, monotone painting of the picture, and then I build it up by glazes. So it is in the form of, um, you know, of, of, of the pet master's way of painting where they didn't use, it wasn't about the brush strokes, but about the buildup of paint. So the color, so I wanna show you in this example here. So this painting originally started off just as a yellow ochre monotone painting. The color that you see on her skin is not a color that's like a, a, a you know, a purple color that's on there. It's a layer that was built up. So it was yellow ochre first, and then it was a, trans, a transparent white, and then a uh, then a uh, uh, what's called a a, a a a red a tone of red. All using I use the medium called a uh, merge medium, which is kind of toxic now. Uh, I don't use it anymore, but it's a combination of all, uh, linseed oil, beeswax. And um, and lead. <laughs> so, but this this what this allowed me uh, the paint to do is to have a um, um, to be translucent. So everything was done. Um, everything was built up uh, in tra with layers of paint. Even the black. This was originally brown, then blue, and then you know, then layers of color until you get to that uh, to the um, to the color that you want. In the same way, when we look at skin. We look at the skin and we see, we know that it's a buildup. We see it, if you look at your hand, you'll see green, you'll see red, you'll see blue. All those things are underneath, and that's how I build up the color. And that's my approach. That's how I've been doing most of my portraits. I've been doing things a little bit different now, but that is a traditional way that I paint. Um, so the idea of showing brush strokes. It's not something that uh, you know that I, I uh, uh, that I worked on. It's more about showing the uh, the layer and the uh, the the um, brilliancy of color by creating layer and also having almost like a glaze. Because each time I do a layer of paint, I would varnish it and then do another layer of paint on top of that. So it almost it's almost like a, it's one's sitting on glass on top of glass on top of glass. So it kind of floats up in front. Yeah, they have that luminous quality, you know, which is so wonderful. So what kind of varnish yeah. do you use? Excuse me? What kind oh, of varnish? What, what, I use for not, uh, uh, the Mar varnish. Oh, okay. Um, so, so now I'm getting to work that's a little bit more contemporary. So, and um, thinking about masks again, it's the same idea of showing, but uh, the idea of hiding behind something, hiding in plain sight. Um, you know, the idea of cam uh, camouflage is when, um, oh, what's going on? Power's going off and on. Uh, the idea of camouflage is, is that you're trying to hide, but idea, but also being, you know, when you're a so in this painting, you can see the child, you know, the self portrait of somebody that, you know, if you think about when you were a kid, you thought about disappearing by putting a blanket over your head, right? So, in the same way, the same way, if I close my eyes, I can hide from what's, what's around. So I can, I can blend into, blend into um, to the world without being seen, but being seen at the same time, you know? And a lot of that, had to do with has to do with my um you know uh, my sexuality my idea of being uh, being an Asian uh, like a, a uh, like a uh, a new person in the country um, trying to fit in but not trying to stand out 
And growing up, you know, I think the mantra that, you know, our parents gave is like, don't make trouble, don't get, don't get into trouble, don't cause trouble, you know, be, um, be, keep a low profile as much as possible, keep, possible, keep your head down. If somebody says something to you, do not respond, just, you know, just go about your business, you just live your life and be safe, right? So in the same idea, so that's, that, con that, that, um, that kind of um, that, um, you know, um, that lesson that I was taught as a young kind of like stuck through as I grew up, you know, with, and only recently that I started to, um, did I would say that I began to, you know, uh, open up or to, you know, stand up for myself or to like, um, you know, to, to, to you know, point out when things are wrong. Um, you know, uh, and a lot of it had to do with fear, the fear that, you know, that you would get persecuted, that you'd get hurt, you know, being a, a person of color in this country, um, you know, it's, it's crazier now, but it was even worse back then, it wasn't safe for us. So to be safe was to be to, to keep quiet, to, to be blended into the be blended into the world, but at the same time wanting to show off. Right. And that's why I use colors that were like, you know, saying, hey, I'm here. I'm, you know, I, I can, I'm, you know, I, I want to be noticed, but I don't want to be noticed. That, that, that uh, kind of like, uh, you know, push and pull of being trying to be there and not be there. And that's, you know, and this kind of language continued in my painting. So, you know, um, what I've learned, they say that being, passive the most harmful or most violent type of emotion for a person is not anger or greed or love they say the thing that's most um, causes more problems or, or that causes more uh, pain is being passive the idea of being passive aggressive you know, so, or having the most impact. So if you think about it, if somebody says, I hate you, and then somebody, rather than that, not somebody that doesn't say I hate you, but does all these hints to indicate that they hate you. What is that? Like, what do they say? Death by a million uh, cuts? It's kind of like in the same way, in the same way in painting, the way that we can do most, uh, I thought the way that I can be, send out the messages that I want the best and the best way to be most effective is by being passive aggressive. So when we do paintings, when we have these messages, it's like saying, hey, I'm trying to say something. You may, it may come to you. And if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you know, you know, you don't get it, but you are getting a hint of something. Right, you, you when somebody does something that's a passive aggressive to you, microaggressions, you you know that there is there is a there, that the a message is being said to you, be it being positive or negative, but you sense it. You may not know what it is, right? right. So, um, so in the same way, paintings we can sometimes be effective by being passive aggressive. We won't say exactly what we're trying to say, but we're hinting at it, and that hint can be like, hey, you know, if um, think of it as something, hey, is that person trying to say something to me? Is that person, is that person really, you know, making a comment, a statement that's, you know, and, and I thought about that way and I thought about how I can express ideas by using imagery, being passive aggressive, be positive. And in this painting, you know, I was thinking about patterns and spirit animals. So this was, you know, at, at some point you want to start painting things that will make you, you know, bring joy to yourself or kind of express who you are uh, the, rather than in a dark way, but, you know, show out your happy part. And so this is my spirit animal, <laughs> spirit animal, and I see myself as a penguin. So it's a kind of like, a, you know, a fun painting that I did using patterns uh, and showing and what it doesn't show here. This painting actually has a silver, um, uh, what's it called? It has a... It's painted, not painted, but uh, has silver foil all around the edges. So everything having the idea of uh, having worlds has a silver lighting 
and then there's always one black cloud in the sky that you have to deal with. And, you know, you just need to persevere and go forward um, and, you know, feel like penguins kind of do that. <laughs> so this is my pet penguin painting. Um, you know, and then, you know, again, all things doesn't always have to be dark or sad or mean. And I learned this lesson in a painting when I was doing a series of paintings. So for me, when I do a painting, I, can't, I, can't, I get deeply immersed in it. And I think all of you understand when you get into a zone, you keep going with it. Um, I did a series of dark paintings that talked about a pain and anger uh, and frustration. And it really affected who, you know, my psyche and how I was feeling. Uh, I kinda, kinda, you might kind of relate, relate it to somebody that's a method actor right? So that they get into a role and they can't get out of it. So the idea, so I started thinking, okay, maybe it doesn't all, messages don't all have to be, um, you know, serious. It can be fun. It can be light. It can be happy. So I thought uh, this is a painting of what I call Mighty Tidy Whitey, the idea of somebody just, um, a portrait of somebody just in actually Salon Dior in the, at the Corcoran, um, you know, flaunting around in his underwear. Nothing, nothing, um, you know, offensive, but funny enough. So that started. And then more important, this is just another portrait that I did. Uh, this is a, a person I met in New York. Uh, he, I calls himself a bon vivant. He just was, uh, he just had a, a face that, well, that you just wanted to paint. I painted him earlier, it was a scully. Um, so I did a few more paintings with him as a subject. Then again, starting to simplify, and then I'm looking at patterns. Here is another painting that I did uh, talking about the same idea. So this is inspired by somebody named Bob. And, um, and uh, you could drop me off and you can go mail it, or I can go mail it with you. That's can it. you please mute? mute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop you off, okay. and then I'm going to go mail it. OK. Barbara, please mute your uh, And I got to go to the store, and then I got to go all kinds of stuff. There you go. Okay. Um, so this is a painting. So I did start. I also started a painting that was, um, you know, I started thinking about uh, the idea of hiding in plain sight. You saw an earlier painting before, right? Um, and the background is wallpaper pattern. The idea of being being somebody being a wallpaper, somebody that's being uh, you know uh, being a wallpaper at a party, right? So be, um, not being trying not to be seen, but be seen at the same time. So Bob Meiser was a photographer back in I think the sixties or fifties, and he was known for male physique paintings. And these magazine these magazines were you know sold at your dime stores and your drug stores, and you know it was under the idea of showing you know the the, the, the ideal male physique, how men should uh, uh, aspire to in the way that they look. But on the surface, that, that's what it was, um, you know, what people, it was shown to the public. But in actuality, it was a homoerotic magazine. And people ordered it, and not for that purposes, uh, but for like, it was basically like the playboy of its time, but not in, not shown into the public. It showed in, 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 into the world. It was just, uh, and it was accepted as like, oh, it's an acceptable male photography magazine. Um, and the idea that this man is obviously, I mean, the idea of being, being showing his sexuality, but being hidden at the same time, kind of like uh, being, uh, being uh, hiding in plain sight again. Again, so the idea, so uh, uh, with the same idea of using the idea of wallpaper, you know, the idea that it's a decorative thing that's on the wall, it's it's there, but it's not, you know, not it's not it's not the focus of what's there. It's the furniture, it's the people in it, right? So uh, how people um, want to be viewed, but not to make waves. Not I want to be seen, but not seen. Um, the idea of like, uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of like almost in fear of, of uh, the idea that not wanting to be, uh, you know, making too, too much to be noticed too much, but noticed just enough. Same idea, wallpaper.
and you create all this wallpaper yourself. So like the monotonous uh, little images, you paint every single one. Ah, so, so this is a good, good point. I actually find wallpaper. So it's found objects. So what, what I do is I do a transfer and I paint on top of that. So the la here, some of these things I do make the patterns with, but early, the earlier paintings, I actually use the wallpaper. For example, this is wallpaper. And I, uh, I, I find the wallpaper. I take can, I take gesso and glue and I mount it onto the board, be it canvas or a board. A wooden board, and then what I do is I uh, I press it down with a uh, you know books and magazine until it's like solid on there, and then what I do is I gesso it over with clear gesso, so that I'm able to retain the patterns, find the patterns that I want, and I'll be able to paint on it just like it's just as if it is uh, like a canvas. Um, so I take parts that I want. So this the, the wallpaper here has been simplified to the uh, to uh, to, um, to the look that I want. So as you can see, some some parts are uh, colored in, some parts are not. I change the color scheme of it, right? But I retain the pattern, kind of like kind of kind of like that's almost like a tracing, <laughs> being able to a simple a good, a easy way to trace these images. You know, when I was thinking about these wall uh, about these patterns, I had to think I was thinking about hey, what would be the easiest way? What would be like a good way to do it? I started. Off trying thinking that I could project it. That was, you know, that was really, really difficult. In fact, the um the spirit animal, the the the, the uh, penguin. penguin, that's what I attempt to do here. This is me projecting pattern onto the canvas and then tracing each one. So I found different patterns that I want and, and I trade and I project it on the screen, having to make sure that they're all going to be. You know, uh, you know, not warped. So that was that cause. This is well, I gotta find a different way. This is not working out for me. This is, this will take way too long. So I found that actually, why don't I just get the pattern? Why don't I just put it onto canvas? Why don't I just I don't wanna? Why don't I just transfer on the image and then go from there? So I, like here, I put the canvas. I stretched the canvas. I mean, the, the wallpaper onto the canvas. I gessoed it. And then I wipe just so. So I, what I did, I create, I actually um, did a, uh, I actually took paper and uh, did the shape, outlined the shape of what I wanted to paint for the four figure. And I traced the, 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 the outline of the figure onto the canvas. And then I wipe just so the background of the body so that it's not going to come through. Right, and then, and then I was able to paint. And some parts I, I, I made, some parts I kept clear, so I was able to retain, um, bring some of it through. So, I, so it looks like it's coming actually here, actually kind of just continue the painting over, um, you know, try to continue the pattern on top of it. But I would use white gesso, the parts that I wanted to be opaque, not showing the background, and use clear gesso to, you know, change it. So obviously this, this, this wallpaper did not kind of look like this. I gradient, I, I brought a gradient into it. I blocked out the parts that I want and chose, you know, created the pattern that I want, but using the stencil of, you know, the background for it. And this, this is the same thing I did here, here, and here, all using wallpaper. Again, wallpaper, again. same idea. Now, um, this one, I wonder if I could show you. Oh, here's, um, this is another uh, a portrait that I, I did for with a, an aunt of mine that passed away. And, and here I thought, hey, let me just make my own pattern. I don't know if it's that successful, but I'm happy with the, uh, the idea of, of um, the kind of switching the, the portrait using monotone and, and the muted color. Now, this is a series of paintings that I did. I started simplifying with the idea of what portrait is. So these three, is it four paintings? These three paintings, one, two, and three. These are actually, the images from this is, um, is they're from, they're called Hatsu cards. And I think the Japanese, it's actually come, originally comes from Japan, Japan, but they're also used in Korea. They're Korean playing cards. They're little plastic cards. Um, they're about maybe, they're really small. They're hard to handle, but they're, they're, they're basically poker cards. But 
these are this is a series of a uh, portrait of my father you know sometimes uh, a portrait doesn't necessarily have to be the physical form of the face but what represents who or things that you know brings the memory of who that person is well, my father passed away of, of parkinson's and you know his who he was in the last part of his life was not the person that I knew for the majority of my life. You know, coming into Parkinson's and, and the later stages, and I think it had a little bit of dementia and Alzheimer's, um, that person that you knew no longer exists because um, the disease has taken over, the, uh, the mind has, um, is not firing. So you become, the, you know, we, we, I had to take care of him. He was not in his mind. So I had to find ways where I can remember my father and what uh, the things that uh, I knew when he was happy and joyous and just full of life. And one of the things that he loved to do during New Year's was play this poker game with, with these cards. And each of these cards represents a season. I don't have, I don't, I don't have one of the seasons. I think it's the season, I think it's the month that he passed away. I think I deliberately took that one out. But you know, I recreated these cards larger as a series, as a portrait of my father. To me, to me, I know what it's about, you know, what the, what the story behind it is and why I love it so much. But I also wanted to create something that was aesthetically beautiful. And, you know, people can find relationships to it too. For Korean people, uh, these cards have different meanings for <laughs> for several people. But for me, um, you know, I wanted to kind of honor my father in the way of creating an image and uh, that, that would brought happy memories to me. Um, then I started having fun. So here's the thing with the, uh, so about the idea of camo, about the camo and, uh, and, the, and the idea of imagery. So this is Camo B. I had another painting called Camo Camel, which was a camel on top of a camel. And this was just me, uh, just of me, uh, me exploring the idea of juxtaposing um, different things and putting it together uh, to create imagery. Um, so this is a fun painting that I did. Uh, um, COVID hit. And actually this painting was actually a traditional painting <laughs> And then I covered it in uh, green paint afterwards. Uh, portrait in COVID. Uh, and actually, these paintings that I have here are when I had to start paint, uh, teaching class from, in, from my house on Zoom, teaching students how to paint. So uh, I don't know uh, the, uh, how difficult that is. I mean, especially we're not um, YouTube projection, uh, you know, producers that are able to have good cameras and lighting. We had to do a whole bunch of DIY to create, you know, teach demo and teach how to paint. And this is a, one of the paintings that I did as a demo, um, you know, in class, including this portrait. I was into showing how to do patterns. Uh, and as you can see, this is a, a very traditional way of painting a portrait. This is just a, a demo for it. I use this just so that I have a painting for my bio part in my uh, website. And then I thought about, and, uh, and then simplification. You know, we see a lot of uh, I, uh, emojis and stuff like that. I think in Japan and Korea, the idea of kawaii, which is the idea of being things that are cute and simplified. Uh, which has some another meaning. So um, I started to do a series of paintings that just had you no know, shapes. You know, I thought one of the things that I had thought about in painting is that, hey, maybe I, is it possible to create to create a to create an image that's universal? You know, something that's a void of anything that's, you know, specific, but just something that, you know, that if I look at it every, across the board, everybody will have the same emotion. Everybody will laugh if they see this. Everybody will get like a little bit of an angry, you know, frustrated, the CNV idea of frustration in it. The colors will indicate what, you know, give the clues to how the person's gonna feel. It's gonna be a universal thing, you know? It's, not, it's gonna be like a viewable by everyone and everyone will, be, everyone will get the same idea. Well, that's impossible. I've come to discover that. 
It's, and, and it's just not possible. We know this today. One view of what's going on in the world is somebody's, uh, somebody has a completely different view. One people, one way of, one person of seeing what is freedom will see that another person will see it as oppression. One idea of seeing it as blue, they'll see it as green. People will, like, people cannot, one, one idea, like one, let's say the, the idea of um, the color red, you know? You see it as, uh, uh, some people see it as love, you know, passion. Other people see it as death, murder, blood. Um, so that was, a, a, that's something I discovered that, you know, we just cannot, we can't please, we cannot, we're not, we're not necessarily going to get the image or uh, the expression that we want directly to them and be translated one-to-one. -one. You will never be able to uh, have, to share that, that your feeling and be accepted as how you feel with another person, with everyone. It's just impossible to do. But what you can do is affect people, right? So let's say you look at a painting and you arrive at an idea or a feel feeling. It may not be your intention. It may not be the artist's intention. But the fact that you've came across and thought something about it, then the artist's work is successful, right? You don't need to be, you don't need to have the exact same feel. You don't have to be on the same, you don't have, you don't have to hit the, you don't have to hit the, hit the spot to make sure that it'd be successful to have a good painting, right? Hey, you know, some people say, hey, when you see this, what do you see? And then the person sees something completely different. Then it's still successful because you actually communicated and you affected and you're able to cause change in somebody's ideas or emotions and feelings to you know uh, see something that they may not see but you saw, or they see something that um, they see something else then that's still successful you know if you touch somebody then you did a good job so the idea of simplification happened using pattern I started working on patterns. So another thing is I started making my painting smaller because I think all of you know as artists that the biggest problem is for artists is storage. So smaller paintings is my solution to it. I started simplifying again. Thinking more about shape, color, and design rather, rather than worrying about you know, the form, formal aspects of things. Getting back to you know what is what colors look good how how um, you know how can we work with design shapes and, and the idea of simplification and looking at patterns. How is it in composition? How is it pleasing to the eye? What does it bring up to you? This, with no sort of, no, uh, there's not a uh, it's it's does not it's not non representational. Just looking at pattern. So I did another series of painting and I'm still working, and I, I think I, I'm still interested in is pattern again, but patterns that we're familiar with. You know, this is in the background is Louis Vuitton, um, you know, his floral pattern with the with the with the LV on it. And just juxtaposing a Buddhist monk um, that has void that is supposed to have rel relinquish all things material well, in a background just juxtaposed by something that's completely material. And I think I was inspired by this painting because when I was where I don't know where I was. I think I might have been in New York, and I saw a Buddhist monk, and I think he was like where like he had like a Gucci bag on him, or something that was like really weird. That he was like he was supposed to be you know somebody that's you know completely you know, void of material things, but had like, you know, really late brand name label things. And I kind of thought it was kind of funny. And the same way of idea of, you know, using, you know, the idea of pattern, sometimes you know, just using, um, you know, just having these letters, these uh, patterns on there makes things valuable. You know, who are these people? I did this again. So, this is where I thought about using, you know, hey, why, why relinquish what I was doing in the past? 
where I was being a copyist. Can't I bring that together with what I do now? So here, this is a painting I just finished recently, is um, I, I you juxtapose Michelangelo Sybil, it's on the Sistine Chapel, and putting the pattern Louis, Louis Vuitton on, on in the background. Same here, Speed Racer. You know, I would say this is on the, the world of pop art. Hey, does the value of this painting go up just because I put the LV on it? You know, when we look at art, do we look at the, when we look at art, do we look at the label of who created it, who bought, who bought it, or do we actually look at the art itself? You know? This is uh, one I just did recently again, is just kind of a play on Corona. I think one of the things that we, um, we can do as artists is, and I think uh, an important thing, an, an important task that we have, if you so choose to do it, is what message can you do? You know, what message can you say when you paint, right? When you paint a painting, or when you make art, aren't we kind of like the recorders of history, right? When we look at society, when we look at uh, like the past of what happened in history, what do we look at to identify what the culture was? You know, what do we do? What do we look at to identify what society and and, and the and the what people valued back then? It's the art, right? We look at in Greece. We look at we look at the artwork that was done in Asia, in ancient Asia, ancient ancient Africa, um, Europe. We look at the art that that was done in the past. So who's doing that now? You know, the artists in the past, oh, sure. they, they created, the, they recorded culture, recorded the okay. time. They, they okay. changed the trends of what's, what was going on. So you as artists. Okay, you yes, this, I am. You have this incredible uh, responsibility that if you so do choose, mm -hmm. recording what's going on in the world, right? So in the content, the question is, how about painting things that really, that can talk about what's happening in the world or how things that you're feeling now, things that you're seeing now that other people, when they come back and say, oh, that was, well, that's what was going on. That was, how, that was that point of view of that person. That was what was happening in society. So, you know, I'm talking more in, um, more in an academic sense in like I'm telling my students, right? So I encourage you as artists, to take that role of not just painting a pretty picture, but painting a pretty picture that has some meaning to it, that has a statement, that's able to change somebody, society, maybe the world, right? Do more than the, I encourage you guys to do more in the work that you do. And don't feel like you're saying, hey, you know, I'm just somebody that likes to paint. No, but art is powerful. It really can change what happens. It really can change what, how people value things, you know, for whatever reason. It can go bad, it can go the opposite way, a good way, but your cost can change. You know, when people say like, you know, what have I done in my life? What can I have done? I wish I could, you know, make an effect. I wish I could leave a mark. You as artists have that special capability of being able to see things in the world and translating it into a piece of uh, uh, an object or art or painting or a drawing and then, and, and then preserving it for people to see and share. So you have incredible power. So I encourage you guys to utilize that, you know, use it wisely, share it, you know, and be proud of what you do. So that's part of my artist comp. That's, I think that concludes what I want to talk about my artist, um, about my work and what my philosophy of work is. Um, but let me tell you what's going on at Mason. So, um, you know, I told you I was doing portfolios earlier, right? So one of the things that we're really working on is DEI initiatives. And the idea that we want to encourage everybody to have, be able to paint, to draw, and to photo do photography and sculpture and all those things, and not just people who are privileged, right? And before the idea, and this is something that we're discussing right now. So you can, you, I'm giving you kind of like an earmark of what's happening or what the plans are in the School of Art. 
So the, the idea came before we would, we would let people into the School of Art by how well, how talented they were, right? And the portfolio that they submitted. Luckily in our area, in Fairfax County, we have uh, a very, very um, robust and well-funded art program with art teachers that are able to prepare students and train students to be you know, fantastic. There are a lot of people who don't have that. So when we look at portfolios, we're only looking at people that had that training you know, and that, you know, somebody that had that passion had encouragement to do so. But there are a lot of people who would never get that opportunity because they never, they might not have had an art program or may not, may, may have, have come from families that didn't encourage, you know, showing creative side, being more practical, is what they say. Um, and so we're talking about eliminating portfolios. The idea that, hey, you know, we should let everybody in. You know, if you want to become, if you want to major in philosophy, in college, you don't have to show a portfolio about philosophy. You learn to become a philosopher. You learn philosophy when you get there, right? Engineering school, you know, there's not a portfolio. There's, you know, you have to show good grades, but same idea. You know, we can, everybody has the potential to be good artists. Maybe they're not going to be our idea of what is good art and what is technically good is not there. But people, everybody's able to, you know, have a place in the art world, and we want to give that opportunity to do so. So the question is, if we should, the question that we're discussing right now is the idea of eliminating portfolios altogether, allowing everybody to to come in and do, uh, giving a chance for people to express work, you know. And I know, um, looking at your, um, your community, the art, the um, the Fairfax Arts, I keep on saying Art League, it is Art League, right? Of Art League, I'm guessing a lot of you always had always had a passion. And maybe starting later in life doing what you wanted to do, doing art, right? You finally have time and finally are able to, you know, do something that you're really passionate about. But what if you had that chance to flourish and explore when you were young? You know, what if you had that opportunity and was told, yeah, that's a good path too, right? What if you had the opportunity? What if you were told, hey, you know, that, that you're good enough or you, 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 you have the capability? Where could you have done now? You know, you might not be an artist, but you might how um, the, how how art is in your world may have affected you differently, and how, how and and also how confident you are in what you do. So this is why we're idea uh, of uh, the idea of like um uh, equalizing the field and giving every opportunity. I believe art saves the world. I think it saved my world, my life, right? So it it's it feeds my soul. It makes me happy, and you know, makes me be the person I am. And we want to make sure that everybody has that opportunity to. I, I didn't think we were going to speak for an hour, but I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, I was going to say, I love the idea that you were talking about removing portfolios, but maybe it's removing portfolios to the extent of the way you are using them now, because I think people need to create art to get into an art program, whether it's, you know, good art, bad art, whatever. I mean, but who says it's bad art? I mean, it's, I guess it's your all judgment kind of thing, but um, Maybe it's not portfolios in the sense of judgment, but portfolios in the sense of, okay, you're willing to put art, put in art, whether it comes from, you know, experience or just from doodling and dabbling and stuff. Um, is that, you know, or how do you judge? Uh, because people and children all have the idea that art is easy, going into an art program, that's easy, that's an easy A kind of thing. I don't know, like, just kind of throwing that out there. Yeah, you know what? So we, I mean, that's a, that's that's why it's being discussed, right? So it's uh, it is an idea that is you know a lot of people don't people think hey you know you have to show some sort of talent some sort of interest in it right? But there are so many people right, and we th we thought about we kind of kind of did an experiment also. If we let in people, except the except the people with not. I mean, looking at looking at a group of portfolios, we see some people that's highly talented, highly skilled. They put in work that that's supposed to be in a portfolio. Maybe not all, not a hundred, not brilliant, but they did the work and it looks good. And then you have somebody that didn't know may, uh, didn't know what to put in a portfolio. So it's cartoon drawings, maybe come a couple of sketches. If anybody, uh, somebody would look at it, 
back then would say, hey, there's, there's no way this person, this person is not talented enough to become an artist. This is not going to be a uh, right thing, right? But when it came to once they started being, when they start, their first semester, their first year in class, they get the draw. Everybody's taking their drawing one class. Everybody's taking the foundation 2D design or art history classes. So they're yep. getting the foundation training there. And then we yep. saw that the progression, those people that didn't have the portfolio finally happens. Oh, so this is what you're supposed to do. I know what to do now. And they can, they're able to, to catch up. The people who find out that, hey, this is really not for me, at least in a university setting, they filter out, they go to a different department, they go to a different school, a different part of the college, maybe study uh, mathematics or IT or computers. But the ones that never, never had a chance or never been encouraged, had it finally, finally had a chance to see, hey, you know what? I can do this. You know? and, and we find out, hey, they can progress. So the numbers of people that failed, or if we find that, hey, that's really not for them, came out to be insignificant. So in the small experiment that we had, it worked, right? Cool. So that's where we want to say, like, we got to think of thinking about those people, the marginalized people, the people who don't have a chance. And we don't see them because they may never, they may never try. Because there's a portfolio requirement, they will never apply to the school or try out for it because they think, hey, you know what? I never got any training. I don't know what art is. I don't know, but I kind of want to do that. So they never got that. That door wasn't open to them. Psychologically, it was close to them. But there, I wasn't allowed. Yeah. I wasn't allowed to apply to art school because my mom wouldn't let me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's was, a lot of too. <laughs> he yeah. was not going to let me apply to art school, and so I did. I went to liberal art school, and then um, I, you know, I picked my classes. So I picked a studio arts class, <laughs> and you know, she of course never checked, and I went from there. <laughs> and you, and how, and you know what? I can't tell you the number and it's awful of students. And so one of the things I do is advise our undergraduate and graduate students and the number of students who come in hiding what they're studying or doing double the studying because their parents, they don't want their parents to know that they're doing studying, you know, things that I think are actually really, you know, viable in the world, graphic design, right? They don't want their mom to know or their parents to know or they'll get angry. Same thing that happened to me, right? Yep. But again, I also think I also relate to my past of what I did doing the route that my parents asked me to do and doing, you know, uh, the traditional education and how I succeeded and how I felt versus doing what I really love to do and then, and, and then thriving in it. You know, people always, I think people when they love or passionate or they're confident about what they're doing, they 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 can do beautiful things. You know? Yep. If the people are doing things just because it's just a you know they, they have to, you know, they may succeed, but you know, where's um, is the happiness there? You know, and I really think that happiness and you know joy is a big part of it. I tell you in my class, you know, I if a student if, if I tell my student if you're not doing this class, if you're not enjoying what you're doing right now, if you're not having a great time while you're doing this work, do a different painting. Start over because you're you're doing something wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a question, Bobby. Sure. You know, uh, would you say like in the current um, contemporary art world, there is a uh, what can I say, a, a kind of uh, division between uh, technical perfection and uh, the concept. That is a conversation and discussion that is going to ever, forever be there, right? So, you know, do we value technical skill versus content? Craft over content. Right when we look at this, um, when we look at a painting of that's done like in two minutes, few brush strokes, you know, and that's you know it's my concept versus somebody that took the time and skill and craft to do those things. What do we value more? How do we? How do we? I mean, do we just devalue one thing or the other? I think it has to do with um, with the approach and even craft and intent. Right, mm -hmm. um, there still can be craft when we do things simple. That's 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 abstract, 
I actually find doing abstract work way di more difficult than doing something that's formal painting. Mm -hmm. um, that's just for me. So it, it, it is a conversation. People think, often people say, hey, look, you know what? There's no technical skill in here, right? I also, I know professors who, uh, who um, really, uh, against my, my, uh, my what I, do, I totally do not agree on is um, they would uh, give a student a lower grade for doing work that's not as good as another student. Right. You didn't make this look like it doesn't look like a circle. This is a circle. Your circle is not a circle because it doesn't look like a circle. Um, you need to do it again. It's awful, right? Whereas I see things as like, what? How did you paint that circle? What color is that circle? How much paint did you use? What was the expression that you used? What was the what was the idea behind it? You know. And I think all of that is more valuable than somebody that makes a perfect circle. You know. I think that somebody has that shows expression and you know that shows a painting that has life in it is way more valuable than that something that looks exactly pretty i give you the example of china okay if you go to china there is a, a city that is comprised or a part of town that's comprised of people that duplicate paintings their entire they they do re replications of of, of masterworks like a factory, Van Gogh, um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, all the old uh, and, and current uh, current artists too. They just they're able to, you know, technically copy a painting like you know like no and and rapidly too. Then they ask these these people, okay, I want you to do a painting that's your own. They weren't able to, right? Same idea. The thing is, the content. The idea, the meaning is way more valuable for me than the craft, than, than the skill or techni technical ability to it. And I think we also have, if we want to duplicate things, we have photography, right? There are too many ways that we can actually copy something. I think originality and, you know, having the show of, you know, your physicality to work, you know, has more meaning to it. When, I think sometimes, you know, when I look at a child's painting, like I'm talking like a three-year-old's painting, and I look at somebody, a college person's painting that's been, um, you know, trained to teach, uh, um, taught, taught to paint a specific way, I find more beauty in the three-year-old's painting because it's not affected by what people have told them what art looks like. It's not affected by what what's supposed to look good. They're just freely expressing what they see onto paper. And the beauty in that is so much more creative and more inspiring than looking at, you know, like a, a, a really well done portrait. Thank you, Ulya. Okay, anybody else have any questions? I hope I, got, I, hope I didn't bore you guys. I found my, you know, I really thought I was only gonna speak for a half an hour not knowing what to say. And I know lectures, so here's a problem. In my class, I can see what people look like and how they're responding and I can jump around and step, you know, <laughs> and, and make, make waves and change my conversation. But I, am, I feel like I'm talking into the wind, to the ether. So I'm hope, I hope that I was able to entertain you somewhat in my, in my, um, my artist talk here. Definitely, you brought up a lot of very interesting points to think about. I loved it. And actually, I would love to, like, uh, if I have questions or discuss something with you, I don't know, are we able to contact you? If, if sure, like, I'll give you my email. My, my email is ryi6 at gmu.edu. And you are know what? I would love to see somehow that our students that may work collaboratively with you know with the arts uh, fairfax art league it would be great that the, you guys oh, could put yes. together things maybe even do shows that you know collaborate you guys be in our gallery and we use your gallery space even uh, we have students that are looking for internships that want to participate we have people here so you know it'd be great that i'm looking in the future that we can collaborate and be you know make this fairfax fairfax a, you know really an art center and i think it's happening Thank you, Robert, for that, because we are very much wanting to do that, you know, and I was so happy when you accepted to to do this uh, discussion and talk and everything. I, I will follow up and contact you on that.
Surely, surely. You know that 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 visitor that wanted to do that development thing. Yes. I when I was there, I was I was asking for it. for you guys. You guys, I understand that you want to do a lot of performing arts. I want to see a maker space happen. I would love to see something like the torpedo factory happen there for yes. for our community that's here in Fairfax. So that's what I've I've asked them to do. The thing They're that, wonderful. Yeah, you know, so not and I, I'm not talking in relations to. Um, the, co- the university, but the people here, the people here in the city of Fairfax, that they can actually have, participate and be a part of that, not a university thing, but, but a community thing. Yeah, uh, just let me have your email again so that I can send it to everybody. R-Y? R- I have it on the chat. It's R-Y-I-6. R-Y-I-6. At gmu.edu. At gmu. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.